Welcome to the fourth lecture of Statistical Rethinking 2023. We're going to continue on uh, full steam ahead with the theme from the previous lecture where we started learning about linear regression as a way to estimate the associations we need to address the scientific estimates we have. Uh, just to remind you a little bit, I introduced the geocentric model as a metaphor for linear regression in the sense that it is fantastically wrong in its structure. It doesn't represent the solar system at all, but it's fantastically successful and accurate in, in doing its job, which is to predict where Mars is in the night sky. This strategy of using epicycles to produce um, high quality approximations of natural phenomena can be extended arbitrarily. So here's a nice video from 3Blue1Brown where <clears throat> the same strategy of using epicycles can be used to draw any kind of cyclical path, any kind of orbit, no matter how weird and wiggly. If you have enough little circles embedded on enough little circles, you can draw anything. And as such, uh, linear models, linear regressions can be used to estimate lots of complicated processes, even if they're not linear. Uh, they're, they're scaffolds, statistical scaffolds. And we use them um, to get at scientific estimates, but we need to design them uh, with the scientific model, background model in mind that is external to the linear regression. Uh, and this is because, just to say it again, the linear regression can approximate anything. Uh, and so uh, we need to uh, design it uh, with that knowledge in mind that um, it will accommodate any kind of epicycle uh, we ask it to. The new element, uh, in this lecture is that we will now have for a single generative model have multiple estimates and this will imply uh, multiple estimators which means multiple statistical models that are structurally different and their structural differences are justified uh, by the, the estimate in each case uh, reflected uh, through the generative model and i'll show you how this goes um, the second thing that will be new is Quite often, the estimate we want is not something that's going to show up in a summary table, and that's because it will depend upon multiple unknowns in the posterior distribution uh, or upon um, making some particular assumptions about the population uh, uh, as well. And so when we develop our estimates, uh, in most cases, we need to do some post-processing of the posterior distribution. The new statistical tools in this lecture are categories, uh, categorical variables, uh, and curves. Uh, linear models can handle both, even though neither of these things is linear. Categories are uh, discrete uh, categories, and usually these show up in data tables as indicator or index variables. And um, there are lots of ways to draw curves with linear models. I'm going to talk about splines. But there are many, many other kinds of other additive structures, which are fundamentally built up of little lines like the scaffold on the right of this slide, but they can make um, nonlinear structures. And we really need tools like this because they uh, give us the conditioning, the stratification that we need to get at the estimates we desire. Okay, categories. Uh, so there are lots of things in the natural world which are not continuous. They're discrete unordered types like the seashells on the right. Uh, each of those types of shell is different. Uh, the, there's not a continuum in them, and none of them is more shell than the others. They're all shells. Uh, individual people and nations are also uh, examples of categories that may be more familiar to you. And we will want to stratify by categories in our data uh, because we will need to, to get at the proper estimates we like. And in the context of a linear model, this usually means when we stratify by a category that we fit a separate regression line for each of the categories. So an example, uh, think again of the Howell, uh, Nancy Howell's um, uh, height and weight data that we worked with in the previous lecture. If you look at that data frame, you'll see that there's also a column for age and a column uh, for sex that's labeled male. And this is an indicator variable. It's one if that individual is male, zero if they're female. And I've replotted the height and weight data just for the adults on the right of this slide. And I've colored each point by blue if the point uh, is, is um, male and uh, red if the point is female. 
uh, and you'll see that there's a difference. How would we develop a statistical model to estimate the influence of sex on height and weight? Well, the first thing we need to do, you won't be surprised, is add it to the DAG. Uh, we add it to the DAG first to get some assumptions on paper, and then we're going to develop a generative model that also includes sex. So we want to ask, the, address the question, how are height, weight, and sex causally related? And we're going to focus on the causal influence of sex on height and weight. Uh, but simultaneously, we know that height influences weight. Uh, so we can't ignore height now uh, when, when asking these questions. So um, how do we justify the expansion of the DAG? And think about it. Let me emphasize this point again. I know I've said it before, but it bears saying probably in every lecture, the causes aren't in the data. You can't just look at the scatter plot, uh, even with the color distinction, and know which direction the arrows are supposed to go, right? So think about even uh, in the previous lecture, um, which direction should the arrow go that relates height to weight? And uh, I say something about this in the book. Um, you have to think about the kinds of interventions you're willing to consider uh, to determine which direction the arrow goes. Yeah, and so if you prefer uh, in all of the examples we're doing here to think about height influencing weight, uh, because for most interventions you can think of on height, um, they will necessarily influence weight. Uh, it, and uh, but there are many, there are fewer interventions on weight that would uh, modify height, right? People can exercise and lose weight, but they don't get shorter, right? Uh, but if people grow taller for some reason, they must get heavier because they're more person, and the geometry of the human body requires it. Uh, this isn't to say there are no interventions on weight um, that won't also influence height. It's just we're not considering those, and part of this is that we're confining ourselves to adults. Uh, likewise, for thinking about the causal influence of uh, biological sex on height uh, or weight, which direction should the arrow go? Uh, because of human biology, um, uh, it goes from sex to height, right? Height doesn't influence sex, uh, at least not in humans. In, in some fish it does, but, uh, uh, but not, in, not in humans. Uh, and so this gives us a directionality to the arrows and the same logic for weight. Um, and so we'll consider arrows going from uh, sex to height and sex to weight, but already this makes a graph which has uh, lots more connections in it. It's one of these little triangles. This is one of the most common structures in causal modeling. Uh, it's called a, a mediation graph. And um, what you want to think about this as a graph is saying is that it says that height influences weight, and this is what we had from the previous lecture, uh, and that uh, sex influences both height and weight at the same time. Uh, and therefore, weight is influenced by both height and sex. But those influences, uh, the influence of height is direct, but the influence of sex is both direct and indirect. There are two ways that sex causally influences weight. And there's this path over the top that passes through H, and that is a different kind of influence. It's still an influence, but it's a different kind of influence than the direct influence. Um, so you know that... The, one of the things we do when we translate these DAGs into generative models is you read them as uh, implied functions, that height is a, a function of sex um, and weight is a function of both height and sex. Yeah, so you can see, just sort of read off, once you translate it into this function notation, you can read off um, uh, what's going on in terms of direct causes, but not indirect causes. Indirect causes don't show up uh, in these function declarations. To make a generative model, though, we're going to write these functions. It might help you understand what I mean by an indirect cause if we do a little animation. So here I've drawn the DAG again, uh, and I'm going to set this in motion in a moment. But I just want you to understand what's going to happen. Uh, little, little particles of causation are going to move uh, from sex to both height and weight. And then uh, height will have its causal influence on W as well. Uh, but it'll be colored. Its little particles will be in a different color. They'll be in red for height. And what I want you to see is that when the particles arrive at the, at the train station of, of body weight uh, over there on the upper right, uh, there will be a kind of, the sex effect will be transmitted in two kinds of bundles. Uh, and this is what happens in generative models as well. But this is just a heuristic cartoon way of saying it. So you'll see that that sex particle arrives at height and it packages uh, the red particle and then which moves on to weight. And so the the causal effects that are influencing weight um, are uh, both direct sex and indirectly through height. In a sense, sex and height cooperate uh, in a way to influence weight. 
Uh, we could draw, as I did in the previous lecture, these um, unobserved uh, other causes on each of the variables. In every DAG, these things are implied. You don't have to draw them every time, but um, maybe this will be the last time I draw them. Uh, but it's good to remember that they're there. And when you write the generative function, typically these, these uh, variables will be stochastic because we're imagining there are unmodeled and unobserved and, and often unmeasurable um, other influences which generate variation in each of the measured variables. These are the unobserved causes. Now, luckily, these unobserved causes are ignorable unless they're shared among the measured variables. I want to give you an example of that and what I mean. Um, so, uh, not in humans, but uh, humans have really boring biology, especially when it comes to sex determination. Uh, uh, most vertebrates are much more interesting, so fish and reptiles. Uh, there are lots of uh, vertebrates that determine sex by temperature, by ambient temperature, um, when they're gestating in the egg. And so, for example, turtles uh, and lizards and uh, alligators uh, have temperature-based sex determination. And um, so, uh, for example, for turtles, when it's warmer, um, uh, more females are, are, are hatched. And when it's cold, cooler, uh, more males are hatched. And the opposite for most types of lizards, uh, interestingly. So the, if we were going to try to draw a DAG that had temperature as, as an unmeasured um, uh, influence on sex, well, temperature also influences other things like body weight directly, right? Because it changes the, the ambient ecology and the availability of food and how much of a struggle it is to, to gestate and hatch and so on. Um, so in this case, we've got, it's an unmeasured temperature there. The, the red T on the left is an unmeasured common cause of both sex uh, for turtles and their body weight. And now it's not safe to ignore temperature because it's a confound. And we'll talk more about confounds and what to do with them in future lectures. But I just want to warn you now about this, that uh, when you decide to ignore something, you're making uh, strong assumptions that it's not um, about how many uh, arrows it's inserting into your graph and where. Okay, so we'll proceed in, in humans at least, temperature, as far as we know, does not influence birth sex. And so we uh, can ignore that. And as far as we know, there's, there's no common causes here um, that, that are unmodeled. There are almost certainly common causes of height and weight, uh, like nutrition, that we're not modeling. Maybe we'll take that up in a future lecture. Okay, so we have uh, our generative model, and we need to write it. Here's a very simple version, uh, take, continuing on with the non-biological spirit of the previous lecture, just to keep things simple. This is not a course in human physiology. Uh, we have a function that simulates height and weight, and it takes as inputs uh, a vector of uh, sexes, uh, sex data, um, where uh, one indicates female and two indicates male. And then we need uh, B, which is, this is beta, our proportionality um, of height that is weight from the previous lecture, and a new um, a variable uh, A, which is going to represent the direct effect of sex. And the way I've set this up, the simulation, you can read the code there. Um, if uh, S equals 1, in indicating that the, the synthetic person is female, uh, then on average, height is 150 centimeters. Uh, otherwise, they're male on average is 160. And then uh, I add to that some Gaussian noise with R norm, the random normal, with a standard deviation of 5 or a variance of 25 centimeters. Um, and then weight is simulated. Uh, this is just like the previous lecture. If you go back and look at the code, uh, it's the same uh, approach as before. Ex uh, from height, there's a proportionality um, using B. But now there are going to be two values of B, that bracket S um, that's on B uh, there on the line that starts with W on the left. That indicates that for each value of S, there's a different, possibly a different B value. And so um, men and women can have different proportionalities of weight to height. And then the A thing that's added to it is just a, a constant change in, in average uh, body weight uh, that, again, can be different for each value of S. And then all the data is returned in a data frame. It'll This will make a lot more sense if... Uh, uh, we just run it and you see what the output looks like. So here, um, uh, make an S vector that's a, a hundred individuals uh, with random, uh, uh, male or female drawn at random, uh, simulate uh, their heights and weights. And as input, 
I make uh, both a zero so that there's no no uh, direct effect at all of sex on body weight uh, in this simulation. Uh, and there are slightly different slopes, so that is slightly different proportionalities, uh, 0.5 uh, for women in this simulation and 0.6 for men. And then you get a data frame, uh, which has a column for sex, uh, that was what you input, and then a column for height and weight. And why are we doing this? This helps us think through what we believe about the system and the relationships among the variables. It helps us develop an estimator in a little bit, uh, and then it, it'll help us test that estimator uh, as we go. Okay, so we're going to think scientifically and define our, our questions. Uh, what are the questions we're going to ask of this system? Uh, first uh, question we're going to ask is what's the causal effect of height on weight? We already asked that in the previous lecture and we don't need to revisit that in any detailed sense, but it turns out this is still going to be in these models because of the indirect effect of sex uh, through height. Um, new questions we're going to spend most of the time on today uh, what is the causal effect of sex on weight? And if you think about this question for a second, one thing you realize is that it involves two kinds of sub-causes, the direct and the indirect. And I've tried to highlight the paths on the right that are relevant now. All the arrows in this graph are relevant for as addressing this particular causal question. And finally, what's the direct causal effect of sex on weight? If we want to partial out just one arrow there, the one I've highlighted on the right, we're going to need a different statistical model uh, than um, the one we need to address uh, the previous estimate, this one about the causal effect of sex on weight, or you might call this the total causal effect of sex on weight. And we're going to develop two models, one for each of those questions. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, for both of these, what we need to do is stratified by s, uh, stratified by the sex variable, um, so that we can get a different estimate, a different association between sex and weight and sex and height um, for each sex in the data set. How do we do this mechanistically in a linear model, given that it's composed of lines? Um, well, I have a, a preferred way to do it, and that's what I'm going to teach you. There are a number of ways to do this because linear models are very flexible, and if you're clever with how you code uh, the variables you input that you use as data, you can do this lots of different ways. One of the most common ways, uh, a default for lots of software, is to use indicator variables. These are sometimes called dummy variables, but that's not very nice to say. Uh, variables didn't do anything to you. Uh, let's call them indicator variables, and they're zero one variables that indicate uh, turning on um, some parameter, some unknown that you add to the model. Uh, like I said, most software, a lot of software, linear modeling software, constructs indicator variables for you invisibly in the background when you pass it a factor variable. We're not going to do that here because in this course we build everything ourselves. We don't rest on automation, and that's not because I'm against automation. It's because when you're learning, automation is poisonous. Uh, it, it, it prevents you from learning what's actually going on and understanding the model. So we're going to build it all ourselves. And when we build it ourselves, there's another strategy we want to use, and that's the strategy of index variables. These are um, Index variables are numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They're like ID numbers. And uh, uh, all they do is they let us access particular parameters in the model. Uh, they're addresses, if you will. Um, postal addresses. We're going to use index variables because they have a lot of advantages over indicator variables. First of all, if you code up a model using index variables, you can change the number of categories and the code doesn't have to change. Uh, it, you can run it right away. So that the model, the, you have the same code will work with three categories as with a thousand. Um, and that's a, that's a huge advantage. With the indicator variable strategy, you would need uh, uh, 999 indicator variables for a thousand categories and that's no fun. Um, uh, with index variables, you just need one. You just need the index variable. It's uh, better in most cases for specifying priors as well. If you have scientific information you want to put in the prior, uh, with index variables it's easier, and I'll show you uh, why when we get to the example a little bit later. Um, and in the second half of the course when we learn multi-level models, multi-level models uh, very naturally use index variables to talk about clusters in the data, like uh, locations or batches or, or things like that. So 
how do they work mechanistically and how are they going to get coded up? Well, let's think about a, a toy example. Imagine um, where our categories are colors, and assign magenta, yellow, black, these, these primary pigments, I think these are called. And uh, what we do is for each category, we just give it an index. Uh, in this case, one, two, three, and four. And the ordering of this index doesn't mean anything. These are unordered categories, and the one, two, three, four are labels, but they're going they're labels that let us look that are positions inside a vector. So we're going to have now uh, a set of a vector of parameters. Vector just means a list, uh, if, uh, casually speaking. And we're going to have a, a vector of parameters alpha here, which is of length four because there are four different colors. And when we want to look up, um, the estimate, uh, the, the, the unknown for that corresponds to each color, we look it up by its index value, which is an address, a location uh, on, the, on Alpha Street, if it were, uh, that cyan lives at address one and magenta lives at address two and yellow lives at address three and black lives at address four. And so mechanistically inside the code, we use this index to look up the particular alpha. So uh, for example, here, if this was a linear regression, we in a linear regression, all the action goes on in defining the mean, which is usually indicated as mu sub i, or i is the ith observation or the ith row in your data frame. And we have alpha street here, and there's a variable called color in your data frame, which is the index variable. Uh, and we end up looking it up that way. So let me, sh let me show you um, how this works uh, in, a, in a bit more detailed sense. Again, alpha in these linear models is usually the intercept, right? It, it tells you what the average is. Um, and in this case, it'll be the average for that category. So in the context of weight, body weight, we develop a linear regression to estimate uh, the effect of sex on body weight. Uh, we're gonna uh, have alpha, which is our intercept. And in the model on your screen, all this model will do is estimate the average weight because that's what alpha will be. It will be the average weight in the sample. Um, but if we subscript alpha by sex, which is a column in our data frame, which has ones and twos in it, I show you this on the left, uh, then uh, you can think of it as the sex of the ith person where i is a row. Um, and then there's actually in the model, again, there's Alpha Street. It only has two addresses on it this time because there's only two sexes in this data set. And uh, uh, so what happens is you think about being on row one when the model runs. Uh, uh, I equals one in this case because it's the first row in the data frame. And S equals two. Uh, that is S on row one equals two. And so what the code does when it looks up alpha and the, and the subscript is now two, so it pulls out the second value, which is the second unknown, and that's parameter alpha sub two will get estimated, but it will only get estimated using observations where the value of the S column is two. And likewise for um, rows where the value of the S column is one, uh, alpha sub one will only be estimated using information from those rows where the value of the S column is one. And this does our job. This is there's nothing fancy or mathematical or really interesting going on here. This is just a mechanism uh, uh, for getting the machine to run correctly and do the stratification that we need to address our scientific goal. Okay, well, we need to specify priors. And now we have this uh, vector of, of uh, unknowns, of parameters uh, on alpha street, alpha sub one and alpha sub two. And very often we want to assign them all the same prior. Uh, like in this case, we're going to start out with the idea that uh, uh, we're completely ignorant of human biology and we're going to give uh, both sexes the same prior distribution uh, with a, for body weight, which is um, a normal distribution with mean of 60 and a standard deviation of 10. Uh, and then we're going to let uh, the sample update those priors and show us if there's any difference at all. Uh, now, you don't have to assume they're the same, but this is often uh, a, a situation we find ourselves in. If you use, this is easy if you use index variables because you have this list and you can just give every element of the list the same prior. If you use indicator variables to do this modeling, uh, this becomes much harder because now there's not the symmetry, right, um, that you have in this model where the sexes uh, are, are modeled the same way. If you use indicator variables, one of the sexes becomes the default and the other is an adjustment. I'll say that again. If you use indicator variables, one of the sexes becomes the default and the other becomes an adjustment. And then there's an adjustment parameter that gets a prior. Uh, 
uh, and it can't have the same prior as the default effect because they're all, one of them is an average and the other is an adjustment to an average. Now, I'm not against that in all cases. Sometimes that's more natural. You want to put a prior in the adjustment because you have information about it. Uh, but usually what I show you on the screen here is much more natural and it's easier to ex uh, express scientific knowledge this way. Okay, let's test our code. This is what we always do. What is the total causal effect of sex? Uh, the causal effect of sex um, uh, is something we need to measure from simulation in this, right? Because there's two influences. Uh, there's the direct and the indirect. So you, you, and in this case, it's simple enough that you could even compute it mathematically, but this is not a math stats course. So I'm not gonna teach you that. I wanna teach you something that works even for the complicated cases where uh, it can't be computed uh, analytically, uh, you can just simulate it. So you've got a generative model and you can do experiments with it. And because you can do experiments, because you, you, you are God uh, of your simulation, uh, you can measure uh, any causal effect you want uh, through experiments. And an experiment here means intervening on a variable and only one. So what we do to find the, causal, the total causal effect of sex through both paths is to uh, construct two samples, uh, one where everyone's female and the other where everyone's male. And then we look at the average difference um, in, in body weight. And that's the total causal effect of sex, of, of changing sex and only sex uh, on the generative process uh, that produces weight. And uh, for, I do it here for two samples, each of size 100 individuals, and we get that the the mean difference uh, between the, the male sample and the, and the female sample uh, for these particular parameter values uh, is uh, about 20, uh, 21. And so when we test uh, our estimator, this is what we wanna be able to find for these parameter values. And then you can come back here and change these parameter values, do your exp simulation experiment again, compute what we're looking for, test it on your estimator and so on. And that's the cycle of testing. And here's the estimator. Uh, the estimator is uh, the model that we developed that has the indicator variable. So I'm gonna simulate a sample now. Now we're, we're using the same simulation code as on the previous slide, but we're not doing the experiment. We're getting an observational study where the sex is a random Bernoulli variable there um, from 100 individuals. Uh, so there's a mix of men and women in the population in our sample. And we, uh, uh, observe their height and weight now, and now we try to estimate the causal effect of sex through both paths, the total effect using the estimator we developed. Um, and so you run this model, uh, you look at the Precy output at the bottom, you'll see that there are two A variables there because there's one for category one, which is women, and one for category two, which is men. And each of these is the average weight uh, in that subsample. And then the difference between these two is the estimate we're looking for, the total causal effect, uh, uh, both direct and indirect through height on, um, uh, on weight. And you'll see that it's, it's a good estimator. It's getting at the right area. And you can back up to the previous slide, change the parameter values, and then rerun the estimator and assure yourself that it tracks. Uh, as the causal effect changes, as you change the input um, to the simulation, the estimator will track and get the right answer. Now let's analyze the real sample where we don't know the right answer, but now we're, uh, we feel confident that this is uh, the proper estimator if the, the sample is generated according to the assumptions we've sketched out in the DAG and programmed into the generative model. Uh, so uh, the code is identical as before. We set up the sample. I construct the S variable by adding one to the male variable, and we're only looking at adults here, and um, uh, we get our estimate. Now let's do some post-processing. As I, I keep saying, usually with these models, the, the unknowns themselves are not what we want. So uh, the A1 and A2 in this model is not what we're after. We have to do comparisons of those posterior distributions in order to get what we want. So let's consider, for example, thinking about the difference in mean weight, yeah? Uh, the difference in mean weight is not in the posterior. The mean weight of each category is, but we'd like to look at the contrast, that is the difference between category one and category two. So let's compute that. And when you do such calculations, you have to use the whole posterior distribution. So uh, what I'm showing you here are just the posterior distributions of uh, A sub one and A sub two. Uh, 
uh, that is uh, women in red and, and men in blue. These are the means. These are not the distributions of weights in the sample. We'll look at that next. Uh, that looks like this. Uh, in order to simulate the posterior distribution of weights, you've got to use sigma. You have to simulate normally distributed people uh, and their body weights. And that's what I'm doing here. We use R norm and we use the posterior distribution of sigma as well. The whole posterior distribution of sigma as well. And then you see that there's scatter and there's a lot of overlap in body weight. This is not new information to you between men and women uh, in human populations. Also this population. Yeah, men are on average heavier and the, and the difference in those means is quite reliable. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we haven't showed you that yet, but the difference in the means is quite reliable, but there's still lots of overlap in actual realized weights. So, but the overlap you see between the blue and the red is not an indication of its difference. Uh, but we still have to compute the contrasts in both of these cases, the contrast on top and the contrast on bottom to say what the posterior distribution of the difference is between category one and category two. And that's usually the estimate we're after uh, is that contrast. And, and nearly always you have to compute it by taking a difference in posterior distributions or doing some simulation. So here's how that works. Um, you must uh, always be contrasting. Uh, you compute the contrast because it is not legitimate statistically to decide if two things are different or the same just because their distributions overlap. Uh, and there's a particular uh, important reason for this, and that's because, well, it simply doesn't work. And let me show you an example, a toy example. Imagine you had two unknowns for a model, that is two parameters, and their posterior distribution looks like this. As you, you run the model, you draw samples, you plot the scatter plot of those samples, and it looks like the plot on your screen. Um, these, these two parameters are very strongly uh, uh, related to one another. They have a strong positive correlation. I, I'm sure you can see that by looking at the screen. If we plot their densities. Um, I plot parameter one, which is on the horizontal axis in blue, and parameter two on the vertical axis in red. And you see the densities on the right. They overlap a lot. They, they span the same ranges quite a lot. One is on average bigger than the other, but they overlap quite a lot. Nevertheless, their difference is reliably below zero. Yeah, and I'll say that again. The, the distribution of each of these parameters, or the distributions, individual distributions of each parameter overlap a lot, and that's what you see in the blue and the red. But that overlap doesn't tell you that these things aren't reliably different, because if you take the difference of each pair of parameter one and parameter two, and, that, and, and take all those differences and then stack them up in a distribution and plot it, and that's the black density on the right, uh, the, the difference is reliably negative, yeah. Uh, and in a narrow range. And that's because I computed it to be that way. Uh, so the, the, what's the take home message here? Overlap of distributions doesn't indicate that they're the same. Yeah, doesn't indicate that they're different either, uh, but it doesn't indicate they're the same. You have to compute the difference, the contrast. So that's what we do. We get a causal contrast here. Let's talk about the difference in means. Now, the, the densities of the means on the top there don't overlap at all. That is a pretty reliable indication that they're reliably different, but we still have to compute the contrast because that's that's the estimate we want. Uh, and so you compute the contrast just by taking the difference in the two variables um, in the posterior distribution. And that's what the code on this slide does. You just subtract uh, A2, uh, or subtract A1 from A2, and you get um, a distribution of differences. And that's what we plot on the bottom here. And that's the posterior distribution of difference. And so that's our knowledge about the average difference between women and men in this sample um, in body weight. Uh, and uh, it's between five and nine, right? But centered around a little bit less than seven kilograms. Now, what about in realized individual people, not just the averages, right? because there's a lot of variation within each category in body weight. And so the uh, lived experience of people, as it were, uh, is not governed by those means, but by people they actually encounter, right? And so you, I showed you that these distributions overlap a lot. What's the contrast between these distributions? Uh, and so same kind of calculations. We simulate um, individuals from category one and individuals from category two using the whole posterior distribution. And then we take the difference between those two groups. And that's the contrast. And then we plot that. And that's what I show you at the bottom of this slide. And I've added some coloring, um, focused on zero there, because you might ask, OK, but what, what proportion, according to this sample and this model and the posterior distribution that we've, we've gotten uh, derived from them, 
um, what proportion of uh, men are heavier or can expect to be heavier uh, than women? And the answer is 82%. Yeah, or, or another way to say this, if you randomly select an adult man from this population and an adult woman from this population, how often will the man be heavier than the woman? And the answer is 82% of the time. Yeah. There's a lot of overlap, but still, uh, most of the time, um, uh, around 80% of the time, uh, men are heavier than women in this population. Okay, so we've addressed the first S demand, the causal effect, the total causal effect of sex on weight, and that's on the left, and we've updated it, and we've got these two contrasts which answer this question, one just about the means and the other about uh, the whole weight distribution. So this, uh, this is a causal effect because it lets you address the hypothetical intervention of changing someone's birth sex uh, on their weight. Yeah, and it's a distributional answer, notice. Both of these... Uh, plots are distributions, and that is the estimate. There is no point that you want to use as a summary because points are not estimates. Points are decisions uh, that you might take action with. The statistical estimate uh, that contains all the scientific information are these distributions, and that's what you want to communicate to your colleagues. Now we're going to address the second estimate. What's the direct causal effect of sex on weight? And now we need another model because we've got to somehow partial out that indirect effect of height. Uh, or, or sometimes people say block it or control for it. I don't like the word control because control is something you do in experiments, uh, not something that you do with, with statistics. Uh, but we can stratify by height to uh, statistically block the association uh, between um, sex and weight that is transmitted through height. And that's our statistical goal. The estimate we want um, uh, partials out that particular pathway. So what does that mean? Well, if you think about uh, our generative model, there, there are parameters for the indirect effect and the direct effect. Uh, the, those parameters aren't the direct and indirect effects, but they change it, they govern it, and they create it. So um, B is the slopes, and there's one for each uh, category, for each sex. Um, and uh, then there's A, which is the direct effect. So here's a simulation where I make the slopes the same. And so the relation, the causal effect of height on weight is the same for men and women. This is a synthetic example. And then the direct effects are different. Uh, uh, and the way I make this is that uh, men are on average 10 kilograms heavier, uh, regardless of their height. Uh, and then I simulate a sample and then I plot it here. Yeah, and you can see that there's a difference. So. Um, Height uh, influences weight the same way in both of these, uh, in both men and women in this simulation, uh, and, and men are heavier on average. If we fit regression lines independently uh, to men and women, you'll see that they have the same slope, uh, but uh, the blue points are still higher. And that's that effect of giving them the 10 kilogram boost, as it were, that they're 10 kilogram heavier on average than expected for their height. Yeah. And that's what we mean by a direct effect. So how would we then develop a statistical model that can estimate that bonus, as it were, beyond what we'd expect for their height? Well, uh, we use, a, we use a, uh, a linear model. Uh, and we're going to augment the previous one. Uh, remember, we, we just had a model that estimate the total causal effect of sex on weight, where we just had an intercept that was unique to each sex. And we're going to uh, update that model to include now um, the height effect because we've got to stratify by height and that means um, including height as uh, a variable in the regression uh, and this this allows the model to then say for for individuals of the same height um, uh, what are the differences uh, by category and uh, uh, so imagine um, we were ignoring sex for a second and we were doing the regression of of weight on height from the previous lecture. We're going to start with that and we're going to add sex to it. And that's what I'm showing you on this slide. We have alpha the intercept and we have beta the slope, but I've changed one thing. And uh, I've changed this now because this is going to um, make the task a little easier. And, and there's no trick here. There's nothing illegal that's been done. What I've done is called centering. So if you look at this weird term that's multiplying beta, the proportionality constant, we have h sub i, which remember is the individual's height, individual i's height, 
and I'm subtracting h bar. That line over the h is pronounced bar in mathematics. Um, it's like a flat hat on top of the h, and that indicates almost always an average. And so h bar is just the average height in the population. So uh, uh, what this does this is called centering. It's extremely common. I would say it's the default in linear regression for most variables. You don't have to do it, but it makes a lot of things easier. It makes the software run better, uh, first of all, and it usually makes it easier to think about the priors as well. Because what it does is it then means that alpha is the average weight, the expected weight, when an individual's height is average. I'll say that again. It makes the meaning of alpha the expected weight at the expected height. Yeah, because when h sub i is equal to h hat, then that difference is zero, and beta doesn't have any effect on the prediction, and then alpha is all that's activated. Uh, and this is a very convenient way to think about then alpha because then, it, it, first of all, it's in the data, right? Uh, it's, it's easy to think about. It's not off your screen when you plot the data uh, as it was before. So when we develop um, the priors, for example, we can use the priors that we used uh, just a little bit earlier for alpha uh, at the average weight, which is, um, uh, uh, as a prior, we used 60. So uh, one way to think about this is if you take any um, scatter plot of two variables and you're going to fit a line through them, you could draw a vertical line at the average on the x-axis. The average h there is that vertical dashed line, and the average weight is that horizontal dashed line. And there's a point where they meet that's right in the middle, sort of the center of gravity of all the points. And it's a fact about linear regression that the, that the regression line, the best fit line, will pass through that point. Now we're we're getting uh, we're doing posterior distributions of lines and they'll jiggle around, but their center of mass is also going to be pivoting around that point. So again, here's to show you: if you just drew one line using least squares regression, it would pass right through the grand mean, as I tend to call it. Uh, and why is that? Well, because it has to be true. We're just modeling uh, linear regressions; just model expectations. And if all I told you about a person from the sample is that they're of average height, and I ask you to predict their weight. Uh, there's no better guess than the average weight. I'll say that again. If all I told you about uh, about a person from the sample is that they're of average height, um, uh, the best guess of their weight is the average weight, right? It's an average person of average height. They should have average weight. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the relationship is between these two variables. There could be no relationship between the two. If there's no relation between height and weight, you should still guess that they're of average weight because that's the best guess. Yeah, I hope that makes some sense. Uh, and so regression lines pivot through this grand mean point. Uh, and so if alpha has the meaning of the location of that horizontal line, uh, th this makes a, a lot of tasks in modeling easier. Now we can just put S subscripts on everything, and that's really all there is to it in stratifying by categorical variables. And we're gonna we're gonna stratify both effects here, right? We're gonna allow um, we're gonna allow the slope to differ by sex, and we're gonna allow uh, the direct effect, uh, the the so-called intercept alpha. To vary by sex as well. Um, and this is no problem in the code. We just, uh, now we have a street called alpha and we have a street called beta and they have addresses one and two. And uh, the, all of the indexing and, and, and addressing works exactly as before. For uh, the first row, this individual is male. They have address two in both of the vectors, in both the alpha vector and the beta vector. And uh, the second individual is female, has S equals one. Um, and they uh, uh, have address one in both vectors. Now we can analyze the sample. Now you want to test that as well, and I encourage you to do that um, with, with uh, the synthetic data simulation uh, in the comfort of your own home. Uh, you can imagine how that goes, uh, how that works. And uh, now we're gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead to analyzing the sample and show you what we get. Uh, the model programmed into QAP, uh, shown you there at the, on this slide, I hope has no surprises. We just bracket by S and QAP interprets that to mean that you want a vector and it constructs it and does it all for you. And I just want you to see that I've, I've constructed H bar there, which is the uh, average height as well. You just need to compute H bar and pass it in as data. Um, and I do that uh, on this slide as well. It's just the mean height. And the results, I plot them on the right for the posterior means, uh, which is something I don't encourage you usually to do, but just for the sake of, of easy illustration on this slide, uh, show you that uh, the regression lines um, for men and women in this sample have almost exactly the same slope. Yeah, 
almost exactly the same slope, very, very similar. Um, but this doesn't address our estimate yet. Remember, we want the direct effect. Uh, we have to compute the difference in expected weight at each height because that's the direct effect that we want. Yeah. Uh, above and beyond uh, any uh, the weight, uh, any differences on average that are due to differences in height. Um, for men and women of the same height, are they still different weights? Yeah. Uh, now, there aren't a lot of men and women of the same height, but the regression line will let us imagine they were. Yeah, yeah, for any arbitrary height. And so we can compute the contrast. And what we're going to do is for, for each height, we're going to simulate uh, individuals, um, uh, men and women, of that height, and then look at the difference in the simulated weights from the posterior distribution. So here's what the code looks like. I know there's a lot of code here, uh, but actually it's fairly simple. Um, I'm using the link function from the rethinking package, which makes uh, this kind of simulation a little easier. You pass it. Um, data that you want simulated from. So in this case, you're passing it a, an S vector of ones uh, first, uh, and then it, it simulates expected uh, weights because um, that's what the model is set up to do. And then same, uh, then uh, again for uh, men. And then we just take the difference between these two sets of simulations and we get a posterior distribution of differences in expected weight at each height. I'll say that again. We get a posterior distribution of the difference an expected weight at each height um, between men and women, uh, according to the model. And I plot this on the right, uh, and I highlight with the horizontal dashed line zero there, and you'll see that the gravity is right around zero. There's not uh, much difference um, at any height uh, between uh, uh, men and women of the same height. Uh, there's just a little bit uh, on on for really tall heights. Um, Women tend to be a little bit heavier, and for uh, shorter individuals, uh, 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 men tend to be a little bit heavier, and that's due to the difference in slopes of the lines. But uh, the fact is that this weird gray bow tie is sort of straddling right on zero, uh, which is the conclusion we get from this is nearly all of the causal effect of sex on weight acts through height differences. I'll say that again. Nearly all of the causal effect of sex on weight um, uh, acts through um height. And so we observe uh, big mean differences in weight in this population by sex, but that's because um, men are taller. Okay. Uh, so that we, we've got our second estimate now, and we've partialed out uh, uh, the direct effect there, and we've learned something extra. We've got the total causal effect um, uh, estimated on the left, and we've got the uh, uh, direct causal effect estimated on the right, which is almost nothing. Right? There's almost no direct effect. It's not that there's none, but there's almost no direct effect of sex on weight in this population. So just to summarize a bit, uh, categorical variables show up a lot in modeling and you want to get used to them. Um, uh, if nothing else, your experimental units are categories and you usually want to include those in your modeling as well. Uh, I think it's nearly always better to use index coding with categorical variables. Um, and uh, we, we care about them because we want to uh, stratify uh, our, our estimates uh, by the relevant categories. And then once the model is run, you're going to need to extract the posterior samples from the posterior distribution to compute the relevant contrasts, which are the actual estimates of interest. The parameters are rarely the estimate itself. They're things, they're little, little um, latent things that you use to compute the estimate after the model runs. And remember to use the whole posterior distribution, not a point from it. Don't take the posterior mean and compute the, the difference between um, the mean of two different parameters. Instead, compute the difference between the distributions and then take the average. Yeah, always any kind of summary, whether it's a mean or an interval uh, or a standard deviation, should be the last thing you do in your calculations just to summarize in reporting that you have to take the difference between the whole distributions because you get different answers. Uh, and the right way to do it is to summarize last. The wrong way to do it is to summarize first and then take a difference. Okay, that was a lot. Uh, let's take a break. You should review the material up to this point. See where you're confused. Um, try to work through that confusion. Uh, go for a walk. Have a cup of coffee. Um, listen to some music. And whenever you come back, we'll pick up again and talk about curves. And I'll be waiting.
this lecture, I want to talk about some ways that linear models can produce nonlinear shapes. Uh, this part of the lecture is not going to be as detailed and code heavy as the first part. I'm sure you've had enough of that for today. Uh, but there's more details in the book and lots of details in the code examples online if you want to implement uh, these curves for yourself. Uh, so first of all, uh, many natural processes over any reasonably large scale are uh, not linear in a strict sense. Um, so, for example, if we plot height and weight for the whole human lifespan in this sample, not just the adults, that uh, includes kids, uh, we see that this is not a line. Uh, the relationship between height and weight for adults is, is approximately linear, uh, but, over, uh, but for all ages it's not. <clears throat> so how could we model something like this if we want to correctly stratify uh, by height when we examine weight, for example, the effect of sex on weight. Well, we don't need uh, new technology really. We can use linear models to do this because uh, lines are like epicycles and we can cobble them together in big additive functions that can bend in any way we like. Uh, this strategy is not mechanistic in the same sense that the geocentric model is not mechanistic, but you knew linear regression was like that already, right? It's geocentric. Uh, as long as we use it wisely, that's fine. Um, there, there are two popular strategies for these uh, non-mechanistic uh, generalized ways to make linear models bend. And, uh, the first is to use functions like polynomials. <clears throat> uh, this is probably the most common strategy, and it's, it's bad. You should never do it. Uh, I've done it. I feel bad about it. Uh, I will try never to do it again, uh, the, and I'll explain why. Um, I'll explain what polynomials are. And I'll explain why you shouldn't use them. Uh, the second big family of strategies is to use additive functions called splines um, and uh, their relatives to generalized additive models. And there are related uh, methods like Gaussian processes that do essentially the same thing that we'll talk about in the second half of the course. These are a lot less awful. Uh, they're, they're quite useful, in fact. If your goal is to have some a flexible curve that passes through the center of gravity of the points, uh, you should go this route, um, absent some more mechanistic model. All right, what are polynomials? Polynomials are these functions you met in secondary school, probably, where we uh, multiply a variable, the observ observed variable, the x-axis variable, uh, by itself multiple times to make curves of various shapes. And so a polynomial is a series like this, <clears throat> where you have some intercept, and then a, a, the so-called linear term, uh, beta sub 1 times x sub i, where x is some uh, x-axis variable that we're using. Uh, and then in the simplest uh, uh, polynomial, then we have a parabola that we achieve by adding a squared term, where it's b sub 2. Uh, times x sub i2. And, and so beta sub 1 and beta sub 2 are just parameters. They're part of the posterior distribution. And x sub i is just a single column of data. But we construct uh, multiple terms for it inside um, the linear model. This model is still linear technically because it's an additive function of the parameters. I'll say that again. This model is still linear technically because it's an additive function of the parameters. Right? You don't. The parameters aren't exponentiating anything. Yeah, they're just uh, uh, factors in front uh, of each term, and the terms are added together. Um, so polynomials can make lots of shapes. You can add a cube term and uh, x to the fourth and x to the fifth and so on. Sky's the limit. Um, and you can fit all kinds of data this way. I'll have a particularly shocking example in a future lecture. Um, uh, but the, the curves on the right of this slide give you an idea of what uh, polynomial shapes can do. Um, and you can fit data with these things. You can. Uh, they're very limited, though, and they're hardly ever a good idea. And the reason is because they have lots of symmetries that are undesirable from a scientific standpoint. Uh, they, they, um, so, for example, the parabola, as I'll show you on the next slide, uh, is always perfectly symmetric. Uh, but often we don't want the curve to be symmetric. That's not a scientifically reasonable assumption. Uh, but the major issue is the way uncertainties are represented in these things. You get uh, explosive uncertainty at the edges of the data um, uh, where you wouldn't with a more scientifically reasonable model. 
<clears throat> and the, the fundamental reason for all of these problems <clears throat> is that uh, polynomials don't smooth uh, locally. That is, they don't, they don't determine the shape of the curve by only looking in regions of the x-axis, but they determine the shape of the curve by looking at the whole x-axis at once. And maybe that sounds good because it sounds a bit megalomaniacal, uh, but actually it's really bad because it means a data point in any part of the x-axis can change the shape of the curve f uh, arbitrarily far away from itself. I'll say that again. It means that any data point in any region of the x-axis can change the shape of the curve arbitrarily far from where it is. And that's bad news. Uh, instead, we want local smoothing, and that's what splines will provide, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Let me show you <clears throat> um, how polynomials behave in, in Bayesian updating. They behave the same way in non-Bayesian. Uh, statistical paradigms as well, of course. Uh, but here's the, the posterior distribution updating animation, like the one I showed you earlier um, uh, in the previous lecture uh, for linear regression. So on the left, uh, we have a, a prior distribution for the beta sub 1 and beta sub 2 that determine the shape of a parabola. Uh, the equation for that parabola is shown above the plot on the right. Uh, and uh, the curves there are just three randomly sampled parabolas. Um, from the prior distribution. You'll notice that one of them looks like a line uh, because uh, it, it bends much, much further away off the, off the slide. <clears throat> now I'm going to introduce a few points and let it update. You'll see from the prior, they wiggle all over. We see one data point. Already they bend down. Why is that? Just because parabolas must bend. Uh, and so as you'll see, as the data piles in, most of the data will be on the left. There's just this one point on the right. From a completely general perspective, there's basically no evidence that this relationship is really parabolic um, uh, or, or symmetrical uh, for that matter, and yet that's what the parabolas must do. Uh, and you'll notice that the uncertainty, the, the width of the gray region, flares out at the, at the ends of the data there. Um, all these things make uh, uh, parabolas and, and higher order polynomials uh, quite undesirable from a modeling perspective because they make a bunch of assumptions that you don't really regard as useful and uh, they learn less from the data than or, or they learn too much from the data in regions far away from where the data lie. What if we model height and weight this way? Well, you can fit the relationship between height and weight with a parabola. I do it here. Uh, but I want you to notice what happens um, on the far left on this graph after fitting this parabola uh, to the height and weight data. Uh, it, it thinks it that um, uh, babies get heavier uh, for some reason as they get shorter. Yeah, below, uh, below about uh, 50 centimeters, uh, the model predicts they get heavier. Now, obviously, this is ridiculous and you don't believe this, but if it were true that you could use a curve that didn't do this, wouldn't you prefer to do that? Yeah, so don't use parabolas, please. Uh, this, this enforced symmetry is, is quite bad news. Um, <clears throat> it, it means that you can't make predictions outside of the range of the data with any kind of uh, credibility. Uh, you can fit higher order stuff too. So here's a, a fourth order polynomial with a term that is uh, uh, height to the fourth there on the end. And uh, this curve bends three times, right? Uh, and this one makes lots of uh, uh, absurd predictions as well, especially for the taller individuals that there will be, they will grow uh, cataclysmically uh, thinner. Uh, but notice that there's a lot of uncertainty too. The predictions are quite weird on both ends here. You could do a lot better in this particular case by thinking scientifically, which is probably unsurprising. And much later in the course, I'm going to revisit these exact data, and we're going to use um, a more biologically inspired model of growth uh, to redo all the modeling of, of the causal influence of height on weight. And I'll show you how extremely powerful that can be is we're going to get a really good curve that explains the shape of these data. Uh, with a very small number of assumptions and essentially no unknowns. That is, no parameters are needed to fit these two uh, variables together. But that's, that comes in lecture 19, so that's just a promise I'll deliver on later. Let's talk about splines. <clears throat> splines are really, really useful. If you don't have good scientific background information and you just want uh, a good locally inferred a uh, function that gives you that lets you stratify uh, by some continuously varying uh, prediction variable. Um, splines are really nice, and uh, the the sort of simplest ones to explain are called uh, basis splines. Uh, but there are lots of different kinds of splines, and they all work basically the same way. And that's by 
um, adding together a bunch of locally trained terms. That is that there are uh, parameters that are trained only on local regions of the data, and then there are those local regions are smoothed together to make a continuous function. The word spline comes from drafting. Uh, these the, the their tradition of doing this. Uh, lots of people still do this. You do this in carpentry too. Uh, if you want to saw a line in the right place, you have a, a flexible metal or wood bar, and you attach to it these weights. And uh, then you can, um, by adjusting the position of the weights, you can uh, bend this bar to make a smooth curve that you can then draw repeatedly and accurately on a surface. And uh, so this is what a spline is and where the term comes from. So we're using metaphorical splines in the sense that they're flexible, but also that there are anchor points uh, where the weights are that are the control points for the spline and the algorithm uses those anchor points and learns their places but only only in the local region where the anchor point is so just to give you an intuition all the code for uh, fitting splines is in the book and you can find lots of fantastic tutorials and even whole books uh, online about how to work with splines and generalized additive models uh, they're they're a major branch of applied statistics um, what I want to show you here is just some animations to prime your intuition about how they work. So the uh, example that is featured on the cover of my textbook is a historical record of cherry blossom blooms in um, a particular region of Japan where the day of the first bloom has been recorded for a long time. Yeah, about a thousand years uh, with some gaps. And we also have um, other records from these things, but uh, I'm just gonna plot by the year on the horizontal, the day of the first bloom on the vertical. Uh, and and uh, we're gonna be interested in getting some local approximation of that so we can visualize the trend. This is one of the things that splines are really nice for. And then you could stratify by the trend and look at, look at other associations, but we're just gonna try to characterize the trend and get a flexible spline. And what these dancing lines on here are what exist in the prior distribution of the spline before the data populate the graph. So in the absence of the data, basically uh, almost any kind of wiggly curve is possible. And this is the thing about splines. They can take uh, an infinite number of shapes. So the posterior distribution for the spline contains an infinite number of wiggly functions. It really does. And you're, I'm just sampling a few of them for you here. And the blue and the black are just different samples from the posterior so that I can show you more functions simultaneously. Now we're going to populate the data, and if you train the spline on the data, uh, and then we sample splines from the posterior distribution, that's what the blue and the black are now. They're just two samples from the posterior distribution that I show at the same time to show you the variation. So this is a wiggly function. There you know there's still some uncertainty about where the mean is at any particular time, but you can see how it's locally trained, and so you get these uh, reliable sort of little hills and valleys, uh, uh, periods of history when the blooms were earlier or later in the year. Uh, and this is the power of splines. There's no scientific information that goes into the spline, uh, but it's, it's just a flexible curve that can find trends, and that helps you do stratification by continuous variables when you need it. How are they built? Just a little bit about mechanism. Again, I'm not going to get too much into the details. Uh, there's a lot in the book. Um, B splines or basis splines are just linear models with a bunch of additive terms uh, with little synthetic variables. Um, and this is what they look like. So it's a linear regression, literally, where the mu line, mu sub i, that is the expected value of the outcome uh, for case i, is this long, in fact, uh, arbitrarily long, um, uh, series of additive terms. There's an intercept. Uh, and then you have these uh, W parameters, which are parameters to be estimated. There's the W for weight, uh, like the weights on a spline on the right. And then these B sub I's, which enter the model like data, but they're actually, they're artificial data. They're just um, uh, a spline shape. And then the weight determines how important that particular uh, spline shape is in the particular region. You can think about the, the B sub I's as coordinates uh, on the X axis. Um, that allow curves to form. So uh, an animation might make this a little easier. Uh, uh, the, w the weights W are like slopes and the basis functions are synthetic, uh, synthetic variables that are, are local positions. And um, so the, the particular weight parameters get turned on in different regions of the x-axis and this is what allows you uh, 
to make a, a very large number of different flexible curves. So here's an example. I know this is super weird. Uh, what you're looking at here is uh, maybe the world's simplest spline. <clears throat> and uh, there's an x-axis variable. I haven't drawn the axis, but you just imagine the x-axis is some variable like year that ranges or weight or, or um, height or something like that. And the vertical axis is, well, it's the vertical axis, but it's here it's the weighted, weighted basis function is the way the spline sees it. Uh, and what is a basis function? Well, on this plot, there are four basis functions. They're the colored curves. And the B variables in the spline are just the value of those basis functions um, at any particular point. Um, uh, and uh, what the weights are going to do is um, adjust the height of that. They multiply the whole basis function and they make it stronger or weaker. And then the black curve is the spline, and it's the sum, the vertical sum at each point on the horizontal axis of all the basis functions. So let me show you what that what that ends up meaning. So red and basis is basis function one, green is basis function two, blue is basis function three, and cyan is basis function four. So um, uh, and black is the spline. So there's one, uh, <clears throat> there are four weight functions, which is the uh, importance of each of these, um, each of these basis functions. And you can imagine, and for this example, um, I have them set to one minus one, um, one and minus one. And that makes this particular uh, uh, shape of spline by turning them up and down. So to, to appreciate what the weights are doing, I can change their values and you can play around with this thing experimentally and see what happens. Um, so, Imagine I take uh, the first weight variable and um, uh, I flip its value to minus one. What that does is it, on the far left, where the first weight function uh, matters, it uh, devalues uh, uh, basis function one and it makes it negative. And this pulls the whole spline down. But nothing ha else happens in the other areas of the, uh, of the curve because weight one applies to basis function one. I'll say it again, weight one only applies to basis function one. And basis function one is zero everywhere else. It, it only has non-zero value on the left side, yeah, in that region of the x-axis. Now let's think about basis function two, the green one. And say we just flip its value to one instead of negative one. You notice again, basis function one, now it's non-zero internally. It's zero on the far left, it's zero on the far right, and it has its maximum non-zero value um, it's sort of in the middle left there. So when we change its weight, make it really negative or really positive, it either it either pulls that that only that region of the curve really far down or really far up. So by flipping it to one here, we pulled the spline up, uh, but the far right has remained the same and the far left has remained the same because basis function two can't affect those regions. Uh, same for uh, the blue curve three. Let's flip its value to minus one in uh, basis function three, only in this particular region. So changing that weight only pulls us down in that region. And finally, basis function four on the far right, if I flip its value to one instead of negative one, uh, it pulls that only that region of the curve up. And now we've essentially inverted the spline from where we started. Um, so adjusting these weights, they can be, they don't have to be ones or minus ones, they can be any number. You can make a bunch of curves and the more of these anchor points you have, the more basis functions you have and the more wiggly of a curve you can get. Okay, <clears throat> so just as a toy example, we could fit a spline to um, height as a function of age. Uh, we haven't looked at a plot of height against age for, the, for Nancy Howell's data yet, but this is what it looks like. Uh, and uh, these are humans, they're born, they grow rapidly, they have a long adolescence. And then as adults, um, uh, we mainly stay the same stature, although we do get a bit shorter in old age. This is obviously not a linear relationship. Uh, at best, it's, it's piecewise linear, which would mean some lines uh, stuck together at their ends. Uh, we want a function to approximate it so that if we needed to, we could stratify by age. And um, uh, I'm fitting a spline just as an example, but I would never do this because we know a lot about the biology of height and how humans grow, and we'd rather build models that way. Um, but as an example of, of how splines can fit arbitrary, uh, curves quite well. I'll give you an example. Uh, just as a comment, uh, what we're implying here is that age is a causal influence on height, right? So we could add it to our DAG. Uh, it's a little bit weird to say that age is a cause because you can't imagine an intervention, right? You can't experimentally uh, adjust someone's age, right? 
uh, you know, not in the absence of time travel. Yeah, but that adjusts everybody's age. And uh, some people think if you can't define an intervention, you can't talk about it being a cause. Now, I think it's fine to talk about things being causes when you can't intervene on them. There are lots of things like that, uh, and that's fine. But age is a, it is important to think carefully about what you really mean when you say age is a causal effect. Most of the time what we mean is that age is just a marker for time past and other things, the causes accumulate during, during that time, but those are the real causes. And if we could measure those accumulated causes and add them to the model, age would have no association uh, uh, afterwards. But we can't measure those things. Uh, in this case, all the accumulated growth instances. Um, and so age is a proxy and it can be extremely useful to think of it as a cause. Okay, so now I'm gonna train a Bayesian spline uh, on um, uh, the height uh, and age data. I'm gonna start with 10 individuals and here's a sample from the posterior distribution chain trained on 10 individuals. And I'm gonna start it animating and then the animation will layer in data as it goes and you can see what happens. First, it's extremely wiggly. Now we add some more points. It's still a bit wiggly. You'll notice it's very, very wiggly outside the range of the data. It can do anything it wants. And one of the weird things here is the spline knows nothing about biology, so it's happy to let individuals get shorter by an arbitrary amount at any age, which is something you would not let a biological model do, right? Uh, any particular individual is expected to grow until older age when they might get slightly shorter. But you'll notice that the spline learns the path through the expect expectation um, at each age uh, very well and uh, has no problem having that little bin there and it's locally smoothed right and this is what lets it do it unlike a polynomial which would go crazy with data like this because in order to have that sharp bend around age 20 it's got to bend in other places too <clears throat> here are the basis functions i'm going to show that animation again this time with the basis functions so you can get an idea of what's going on to remind you so the basis functions are these hills that are under the blue spline <clears throat> and what the weight parameters that are getting learned do is they make these hills uh, shorter or smaller and then the spline is the sum of the hills at any vertical slice any vertical point on the x-axis uh, and you can see that a little better here <clears throat> so you can see how the basis functions are learning from the data and then adjust their height and then if you add together uh, the black hills at any particular vertical point you get the blue uh, curve and this is what splines are. So this is how they're fundamentally additive or linear underneath because they're a sum of these curves. Okay, uh, splines are great. Uh, we often need curves. Um, and if you don't have uh, a strong generative model with which to um, constrain the function, uh, splines are great. And this makes them a, a very common tool in applied statistics. Uh, Gaussian processes, uh, likewise, very much like splines, um, but a more Bayesian flavored spline. Uh, in the case of height, we do a lot better by thinking biologically and the, and the scientific literature on height does not use splines and, uh, and well, it shouldn't. Uh, if we thought about human height, <clears throat> what we probably wanna do, or one strategy that I'm a fan of is to think about growth phases. We know that humans, have distinct um, biologically controlled growth phases. There's infancy where there's very rapid growth. Then there's childhood where there's slower growth and well, there's rapid growth of the head during childhood and slower growth of the body. And then there's puberty where um, the brain is stopped growing uh, essentially by the onset of puberty. You get all the brain you're gonna get by the age of 12 and um, <clears throat> it still reorganizes and you still learn things of course, but it's not gonna get any bigger. And, uh, and then the body, you grow into your head, as it were, uh, during puberty. Uh, and, uh, and then there's adulthood in which you, you level off, but there is a, tends to be a, a slight decline in stature in the long run during adulthood because uh, gravity wears us down. Uh, modeling each of these phases is a much more productive strategy uh, because you can put in the right constraints. Individuals get taller, they don't get shorter during the first three growth phases. Um, and there would be there would be parameters unknowns in each phase which would have biological meaning and you could do meaningful comparisons between them and so on okay uh, thank you for your attention i hope uh, uh, some of that was clear at least uh, i encourage you to review these two lectures at least the slides uh, before next week and for you before the lectures next week because there's been a lot in these i probably don't have to tell you that and these are foundational um, 
uh, in terms of the tools we've used, you've learned how to fit lines and you've learned how to use categorical variables. And we're going to, in the next, starting next week, take those foundational tools and add no more for a while. Uh, we're going to keep using um, linear models uh, with categorical variables, and we're going to examine new estimands and new problems in developing estimators. But all of the statistical tools we're going to need for a couple weeks are in place now. Uh, and so I, I emphasize that so that you know you should review a bit and make sure uh, you, you've got these, um, and also to relax you a bit. Uh, from here on out, we're going to be focusing on more examples, but not so much on statistical machinery uh, that's in place. Okay, I'll see you next week. see you there. Are you still here? Well, as long as you're here, would you like some more? How about some bonus content? All right, just a little bit. So one of the things I left out in the main lecture, because it honestly just got too long, is this uh, style of causal modeling that I call full luxury bays. This is just my joke term for it. Um, it's meant to be a bit ironic. Uh, it's equivalent to what I showed you in lecture, which is to say the typical approach when using linear models to do causal, uh, to, to satisfy causal estimates is for each estimate, we need a different statistical model. And that's what I did in the main lecture when I analyzed the, the causal influence of sex uh, on weight. Um, each estimate uh, may need its own statistical model because it needs to stratify on different things. Uh, but there's an there's a, an alternative and equivalent approach that only needs one model, uh, and it's a model that represents the generative model, and then you can run simulations from that model after you fit it to to get each uh, estimate that you require. These approaches are perfectly equivalent, and they require uh, similar amounts of work. Uh, um, it all depends upon which style you prefer. Uh, this is the style that I tend to use in my own work, but um, uh, it, it, it doesn't really necessarily have advantages or disadvantages from the other. Uh, they're just fewer models to write. Um, but it requires more simulation, typically, than the other approach. The other approach requires defining more models, and this approach requires more simulations to write. So what would this look like in the case of what we did uh, in the main lecture? Same generative model, and we're just going to express the generative model, shown in schematic by the DAG on the right of the slide, as a single statistical model that has multiple relationships, all the relationships inside of it. So one way to think about this is that we've got a weight submodel, that is our weight as a function of stuff. Remember the DAG implies that weight is a function of height and sex. So we write a linear model to express that inside the QAP model here. And that's the part of the formula that's commented as weight. And you'll, you'll see that that's the weight model we used um, in the main part of the lecture. It's the same. Uh, stratified by sex, and, and it's a regression of weight on height stratified by sex. That's all it is. But we also have a model for height and, and how height is influenced by sex. And this is not some, this is something we did not do in the main lecture uh, at all. But when you do full luxury Bayes, you will do this because you will program the whole DAG and whole generative model inside one big Bayesian network model like this. And uh, the height model is super simpler, super simple. It just stratifies height by sex, so we get a mean height by each sex. Why would we do this? Um, well, the answer is because if we estimate both of these models simultaneously, we're using the sample to estimate, well, the whole generative model, all the features of the generative model. And then we can run simulations out of that estimated generative model to get the causal estimates we want in exactly the same way that we can run simulations from our, from our generative model uh, counterfactually to explore what causal effects would be in any particular scenario. Yeah, but now we've got estimates. So it's like getting estimates of the parameters and then plugging them back into the generative simulation. Uh, so uh, think of it like this, the, the sub models, uh, the top part, the weight model is those two arrows, those two red arrows, uh, H and S pointing into W. And then the bottom model, the height model is just the one arrow from S to H. But these are, these are both sub-models of the full DAG. Uh, 
when we run the simulations, we, we, we run the whole DAG, but you, you'll get a posterior distribution that contains a bunch of stuff. Uh, don't worry, your computer it won't complain. It'll do this very fast. And now you, you want to think about causal effects as interventions, and you're going to simulate those interventions and uh, look at the effects that way. And that's how you get your causal estimates in this approach. So let me show you. Uh, how to do what we did in the main lecture, but from this approach. So we've, we've run the full luxury Bayes model that was on the previous slide. We extract the posterior distribution. That's what the code on the left does first. Uh, then there's some bookkeeping. I define H bar as the average height in the population. And N is the number of simulations, number of simulated people I'm going to run. And 1E4 is 10,000. And now with the posterior distribution, the, the with command in R lets you define a, a chunk of code that's in a particular um, uh, um, scope is what it's called. It's a weird word to use, but scope. And so what this means is post now, the posterior distribution is going to be in scope for all of the code that's in that block. And that means you don't have to put post dollar sign in front of all the parts of it now. You can just name the parts of it and R will find them. This is very convenient and makes code easier uh, to write and to debug and for other people to read. The first thing we do inside the width block is we simulate weight for um, women, uh, artificial women, and uh, we simulate 10,000 of them, and we simulate their heights using uh, the, the symbol H of the posture distribution, which um, I can back up and show you if you see the little H in the height model at the bottom there. That's just the average height uh, for women or men, depending upon what S equals. So that's just the mean. And tau is the standard deviation of height. And then uh, uh, we simulate weight for women um, using, again, the, the form, same formula that's in the generative model. And now we have those simulations. And then we do the intervention. We define a, a sample where we've intervened on sex uh, counterfactually. And we get a population where everyone is male instead. And we use the right parameters for that. And then the contrast is the causal effect we want. And we, we calculate it. Uh, directly. Um, and so we can get all the same curves this way that we got in the main text, and we fit one model, but we have to do uh, simulations uh, like this at the end. Um, and we get the total causal effect of sex on weight uh, from this calculation. You could also get the partial one, uh, just as before. Remember, the, the partial causal effect would be a contrast of the, uh, of the weight of uh, the difference in weight between men and women at each height. So we could do simulations to look at that as well. Um, so sometimes these uh, causal effects are are written, uh, like I have this notation on the slide here, um, uh, P uh, of W conditional on do S. Now, what does this do mean? I'm going to talk more about this later, but this do represents an intervention. This is a way to one form of notation for causal inference. And the little p represents a distribution. It's like a probability, but it's continuous. So it represents, you read it as the distribution um, of weight conditional on intervening on S. And that's our statistical definition of the causal effect uh, of sex on weight. You can automate this simulation. Luckily, the sim function in the rethinking package, as long as you're using quap, uh, uh, will it knows the model formula and so it can do the simulation for you and, and here's an equivalent way that gives you uh, the same um, estimate of causal effect. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about full luxury bays. I think there'll be an example um, around uh, just after the middle part of the course, another example of doing this. It's equivalent to the idea of defining multiple models. Uh, you have to do the same amount of work. It's just where it's where it is. In the full luxury Bayes approach, the work is at the end of doing more simulations, but you define only one stat model, and it looks like the generative model, so it makes it easier to develop the estimate because the estimate is always the generative model. You pack it all in there. Uh, in the other approach, like I showed in the main lecture, um, uh, you state each estimate, and then you figure out, using a separate logic, um, uh, what uh, variables you need to stratify by. And so you get different statistical models. And many of the examples in the course are going to use this approach because it's valuable to know that logic for other reasons. And this is the logic we're going to focus on a lot more starting in the next week.